If you've been enjoying the Panorama podcast, you can subscribe to it on your favorite podcast app. If you do, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. Reviews and subscriptions really do help. You can also support us directly at patreon.com slash panorao. Also, be sure to check out our YouTube channel for more great Panorao content. Don't forget to like and subscribe there as well. We're also on social media now. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Or you can subscribe to the Panorao newsletter at panorao.com to stay informed about all of our upcoming projects. And now, on to the show. Welcome to the Panorama Podcast with Dr. Lupu. I'm at Lupu. Maybe it's just me, but sometimes I can find myself watching news stories and thinking, there has to be more to this. This feels like I'm missing some context here. Take, for example, the Israel-Palestine conflict. That's a conflict with origins dating back to at least the 19th century. But just like during this most recent outbreak of violence between the two sides, the deep history of that conflict is almost never explored. Or here's another example. There's a simmering quasi-war going on right this second between Ukraine and Russia. I think it's safe to say that most people have heard about Russia's takeover of the Crimea. But when it comes to the motivation behind the seizure of Crimea, most news outlets, at least in my experience, don't seem to go much farther beyond something like, Russia wants a warm water port. Therefore, they took it from the Crimea. If you want to know more about Russia's motivation to secure the territory in eastern Ukraine, you're sort of left in the dark. That is, unless you do a lot of independent research and digging, which, obviously, very few people have the time, energy, or inclination to do. I think that's why I keep on making this podcast. Partly, it's because I'm intrinsically interested in the how and why behind the headlines. Partly, it's because of my academic training, I think I'm in a unique position to be able to go back into the deep history of some of these topics and be able to translate them from academic ease into plain English. And maybe somewhere far down the list, I think of it as a kind of public service. If you're one of the people that stumbles across this podcast, then perhaps you can get some sort of deeper perspective on the how and the why. And on that note, I've been hearing a lot in the media recently about China's treatment of an ethnic minority in the far west of the country. These people are the Uyghurs. If you've been paying attention to the news recently, you might have some understanding about the generally terrible treatment and very difficult time that the Uyghur people are going through right now. China has set up a series of quote-unquote re-education centers that almost the entire Uyghur population has been put through at one point or another. Stories are leaking out of these re-education centers that are horrific. These stories include tales of torture, rape, and murder. The BBC has done a pretty good job of documenting exactly what has been going on inside these re-education camps. China has taken the public stance that all these tales are lies, that their treatment of the Uyghur people is humane, that what is happening in Xinjiang Autonomous Region is not a genocide, and that it's better if everybody stops talking and thinking about the Uyghur people altogether. But nowhere in the headlines, or on the BBC, did I find 
any mention of how this conflict started, who the Uyghur people are, what their relationship is to the rest of China, and how exactly did they come to live in the People's Republic of China in the first place. My interest in the Uyghur people goes back to at least 2013. That was the year that I discovered a bizarre artifact of documentary filmmaking. The Silk Road was a documentary series that was filmed in the late 70s by Japanese public television NHK. The goal of this documentary series was to record what remained of the ancient Silk Road, that is, the overland route from Xi'an, ancient Chang'an, in central China, all the way to the westernmost extremes of the country. This documentary project was the first time that the Chinese and Japanese governments had cooperated on virtually anything since World War II. As one might imagine, relations between the two countries in the years after World War II were still quite frosty. I'm going to try to include a link to NHK's Silk Road documentary in the description for our YouTube video. If you're listening on Spotify or Google Play, make sure to give our YouTube channel a quick hit. You should be able to find it there. At any rate, back in 2013, I watched the documentary with increasing fascination. As the Japanese film crew proceeded further and further west, deeper into the wilds of western China, it was almost like they were going back in time. You have to imagine that China, at the time, was not the technical powerhouse that it is fast becoming now. Even in major cities, people got around mostly by bicycle. Everybody was wearing their Mao jackets. There were no futuristic sci-fi Blade Runner looking buildings, nor were there any intricate networks of public transit. And the further west one went, the more rural and dare I say primitive life became. Eventually, the film crew proceeded so far west that they began to encounter real-life, honest-to-God nomads. Pastoral people that lived in yurts and survived by herding and drinking their horse's milk. These people preserved a lifestyle that was literally millennia years old. They would move their flocks of goats and sheep from one pasture to another, following the seasons. In the winters, they would come down out of the mountains onto the broad Eurasian steppe, and in the summers, they would retreat back up to the cool of those same mountains. You can imagine that all of this was conducted on horseback. The lifestyle that these people led evoked images of Genghis Khan uniting the different tribal peoples together into the Mongol horde. But this wasn't happening in the 13th century. It was happening in 1978. As the documentary film crew moved even further west, they encountered ever more exotic and barren deserts like the Gobi and the Taklamakan. Eventually, they would come to cities. These cities were inhabited by a people that scarcely looked like they belonged in the People's Republic of China at all. This was my first introduction to the Uyghur people. These people are ethnically Turkic that live in the far western lands of China in what was known as the Xinjiang Autonomous Region. They were predominantly Muslim and had built their cities on the back of Silk Road trade. One of the staples of that Silk Road trade was the mining and selling of jade. And indeed, in the Silk Road documentary, you're confronted with Uyghur people finding large pieces of jade in rivers and streams, and then taking them to market and selling them for cash. You can imagine how fascinating I found it, that even still, in my lifetime, Silk Road trade of the sort 
that was popular before the era of Christopher Columbus, before long-distance sea navigation made it obsolete, was still going on, albeit when I was a very small child, and albeit in a much diminished form. After that introduction, I took it upon myself to learn a little bit more about the Uyghur people and their history. One of my first questions was how can it be that a Turkic people live in western China? I thought that Turkish people lived in Turkey. Isn't that exceedingly far from Kashgar? Well, as it turns out, the Turkic people, or Turkic peoples, I should say, probably had their origins somewhere in Mongolia. An intrinsic quality of the Turkic peoples was that originally they were nomads, wandering the vast expanses of the Eurasian steppe, all the way from Mongolia far to the west into places like Hungary, largely because of the geography of Central Asia and because the landscape is not particularly amenable to settled agriculture, many different tribal confederations have existed at various times throughout the millennia. One of these confederations was led by a people known as the Xiongnu. We think that the Xiongnu might be the very same people that we in the West know as the Hun, and would eventually give their name to the country of Hungary. These Hun, famously, fought against the Roman Empire at the very end of its existence. At any rate, the Xiongnu seem to have been constituted very similarly to the same type of steppe nomad confederation that Genghis Khan would lead in the 13th century. That is to say, it was dominated by one ethnic group, but consisted of several culturally and militarily similar allied tribes groups of people that lived a similar type of nomadic lifestyle, largely on horseback, but not necessarily speaking the same language, and in many cases had very divergent religious beliefs. The Uyghur were probably one such allied group, riding with the Xiongnu. This would have been the case dating all the way back to the first few centuries AD. Now at this point, I should mention that there is some controversy between Chinese historians and Uyghur historians as to how exactly the Uyghur people found their way to that far western part of China. Uyghur historians claim that the Uyghur people are indigenous to the far western lands of China, that they've always lived there, and that their history goes back for thousands of years. However, Chinese historians disagree they claim that the Uyghur only became the main social and military force in Xinjiang during the 9th century AD when they migrated there from Mongolia after the collapse of the short-lived Uyghur Empire. They also claim that the Uyghur replaced the Han Chinese population who had been there since the Han Dynasty. As with all claims of national identity and the origins of peoples, the truth of the matter seems to be much more messy than that. At any rate, by the 4th century AD, the Xiongnu Confederation would finally disintegrate, and a new Turkic-dominated confederation would fill the power vacuum left by their predecessors. These people are known as the Ti Li. Again, we think that the Uyghur are just one of several ethnic groups that were folded into this larger steppe confederation. At least, in this early period of Tili control, there seems not to have been one central authority or power that united all of the steppe riders together. But by the 7th century AD, one group inside the Tili confederation, the Gokturk, began to take on a more prominent role. These people would ally themselves militarily with China to the east. Now, it should be said, not everyone in this Turkic confederation was happy with the arrangement. Eventually, the Greater Turkic Alliance would be defeated by the Tang Dynasty. After their defeat, the Uyghurs defected to the Tang. Previous to this time, 
in the mid-7th century, the Uyghurs had fought as an allied group in various offenses that the Tang launched against the Tibetan Empire and other hostile Turkic groups. For a brief span of time afterwards, the Uyghur controlled an independent kingdom. This is the so-called Uyghur Khanate. It's also the earliest period that we can firmly date an unmistakably Uyghur presence in Western China. However, this independent Uyghur kingdom would not last for very long. They would come under attack by another steppe tribe. These were the Kyrgyz. If you're familiar with the geography of Central Asia, you might recognize this name from the country Kyrgyzstan. After the fall of the Uyghur Khanate, the survivors migrated south and established the Gonsu Uyghur Kingdom in what is now modern Gonsu, China, and the kingdom of Kochou near modern Turfan. Many of the Uyghurs who settled in Kochou converted to Buddhism, but many others would convert to Manichaeanism. That religion, with its origins in Persia, is a fascinating topic in its own right, and perhaps we'll get its own podcast episode in the future. But for the next several hundred years, the Uyghurs would make a living as an intermediary link in the Greater Silk Road trade network through Central Asia. They were in regular contact with the Sogdian people to the west, and of course, with China to the east. Throughout the 10th and 11th centuries, a slow process of Islamization would occur, whereby many Uyghur people abandoned their Buddhist and Manichaean faiths in favor of Islam. With the rise of Genghis Khan, the Uyghurs would voluntarily submit themselves into the Great Khan's service, along with so many other steppe peoples, much as they had before in those other tribal confederations that I was speaking about earlier. China would only reassert control over the Uyghur people by the late 17th century, nearly a thousand years after the Tang Dynasty lost control over its western provinces. The Uyghurs resumed their role of sometimes allies of the Chinese during this period. They would fight side by side with the Qing Dynasty against several successor states of the Great Mongol Empire that came before, but just like in previous centuries, these alliances were never understood to be permanent. As long as it was convenient for the Uyghur people, they fought with the Qing. But as the 20th century rolled around, and the Qing dynasty gave way to the Republic of China, the Chinese ambition to directly control this territory, now called Xinjiang, or New Territory, became stronger, and the Uyghur desire for independence grew commensurately. In fact, several conflicts and uprisings between a quasi-independent Uyghur state known as the East Turkestan Republic, and the government of China were fought on a rolling basis throughout the 1930s and 40s. Eventually, in 1937, with the help of the Soviet Union, these rebellions were quashed. Hostilities would not be halted for long, though. The Uyghurs and other allied Turkic people would take another stab at independence, this time in the late 1940s, with the Second East Turkestan Republic. That conflict would be ended by Chairman Mao. The deal went something like this. The newly minted People's Republic of China would grant a state of semi-independence to the Uyghurs of Xinjiang. And so, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region was established in 1955. At the same time, those Uyghurs who fought against communist rule would flee to Turkey. Several other Turkic groups would flee China into the Soviet Union, hoping to try their luck there. China, for its part, between the 1950s and 1970s, would sponsor a mass migration of Han Chinese people from the eastern parts of China to Xinjiang, increasing the ethnic Chinese population of the province from around 7 to about 40 percent. Meanwhile, Xinjiang would serve as a flashpoint between the Soviet Union and China itself, with the Soviet Union tacitly supporting the Uyghur independence movement in order to better fight the Chinese. China, recognizing the move, would support the Afghan Mujahideen during the Soviet Union's adventure in Afghanistan. As it turns out, 
China and Russia are not particularly close allies, after all. I remember reading all of this information with the usual kind of detached academic interest that I have for the classics. I tend not to invest emotionally in stories of Augustus and Julius Caesar, because while they are fascinating to me, they are fundamentally remote and alien. So imagine my surprise when the Uyghur people began to make headlines here in the United States. It was almost like, as soon as I had learned about the existence of the Uyghur people, I couldn't stop hearing about them. Of course, now, I was hearing decidedly negative things. So I did some more digging into the genesis of the current Uyghur conflict. Apparently, in 2008, back when I didn't even know that the Uyghur people existed, an Islamist group of Uyghurs launched a series of terrorist attacks against the Chinese government, the most spectacular of which involved two men with suspected ties to a Uyghur separatist movement who drove a truck into a group of 70 police officers who were out for a morning jog, and then proceeded to attack them with grenades and machetes, resulting in the death of 16 of the police officers. At least, that's the story that the Chinese government tells. Apparently, some foreign tourists observed the attack, and they say that the attackers appeared to be machete-wielding paramilitary officers. Either way, 2008 seems to be the start of the current trouble for the Uyghurs. A series of attacks occurred both in Kashgar and Hotan, two prominent Uyghur-majority cities in Xinjiang. The violence would continue all the way up to 2014. I actually remember reading about one particularly bad attack orchestrated by Uyghur separatists in that same year. A group of knife-wielding terrorists attacked the Kunming railway station killing 31 and injuring 141 others. It was around that time that things began to go south for the Uyghur people. China's solution to this spate of terrorist attacks that were launched between 2008 and roughly 2015 was a series of ever-increasing security measures imposed on the Uyghur people in Xinjiang. First, Many police stations were built at 100-meter intervals throughout the cities of Kashgar and Hotan. Han Chinese residents of these cities were given panic buttons so that Chinese people could respond to any potential Uyghur attack in under 30 seconds. Next, Uyghur people were required to put their national identification numbers on any and all knives or scissors that they owned so that if an edged weapon were used in a terrorist attack, the person whose identity number was found on the blade would be appropriately punished. Of course, these security measures would culminate in what has now been publicized as the Uyghur Genocide. Mind you, China seems to have learned from the genocidal maniacs of the past, and has largely avoided out-and-out -out killing of the Uyghur population but instead uses its labyrinthine system of re-education camps and security measures to keep the population under total control. I remember reading the news stories when the Chinese government began to demolish historic mosques in and around Kashgar, and thinking to myself, well, I guess I'll never be able to go to that place to see it as it was in the NHK Silk Road documentary. And indeed, as the oppression of the Uyghur people has increased. I remember thinking, I'm never going to get to go to Xinjiang at all, am I? At any rate, you've been listening to the Panorama Podcast with Dr. Lupu. I'm Matt Lupu. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>